Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Now, as everyone starts coming into the, the room, I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. So again, welcome to this morning's uh, session on a look at the future of trade. Um, just so that everyone's aware, you are all on listen only mode and the chat is disabled. So please, if you have any questions, just enter them into the Q&A. And towards the end of the discussion, that's when um, we will you know, address your questions and give you some answers. So with that, I will hand it over to Simona Rasik. Thank you, Lauren. Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to our second program under the LA to DC Goes Global Trade Series. We are welcoming today participants from 13 different states, plus Puerto Rico, Washington DC, and Bogota, Colombia. Welcome. I'm Simona Rasek. I'm a Los Angeles SBDC International Expansion Advisor. I also manage the Los Angeles SBDC International Trade Programs. Today, we are bringing an important conversation to you on current trends, developments, and challenges in the trade compliance. So please take this opportunity to ask your trade compliance questions. I'll be collecting your question from the Q&A box throughout the program, and I'll be presenting your questions at the end of the program. A few words about who we are. We are America's SBDC. Next slide, please. We are America's SBDC, America's nationwide network of small business development centers. SBDCs are hosted by leading universities, colleges, state economic development agencies, and private partners. We are funded in part by the United States Congress through a partnership with the US Small Business Administration. We have nearly a thousand local centers throughout the nation available to provide no cost one-on-one -on -one business advising and low cost training to new and existing businesses. If you're not familiar with our services, please find your local SBDC at the link listed on this slide and let us know how we can support your business growth. The host of today programs are Los Angeles SBDC and Virginia SBDC Global International Trade Departments. Los Angeles SBDC International Trade Program is hosted by the Ventura Economic Development Collaborative, and Virginia SBDC Trade Program is hosted by George Mason University. The contact information for both programs are listed on this slide. We are collaborating to bring you information and resources on recent developments in trade and to address innovative international trade professional development strategies. Our speakers today are experts in the field of international trade. We have Dr. Ray Bowman, the Los Angeles SBDC International Trade Director, and also the Ventura and Santa Barbara SBDC Director. Dr. Bowman is an international trade business veteran with more than 30 years international trade experience. He's also a DAC member, a lecturer, and a business and trade analyst. The success of our LASBDC Global Program is a testament to Dr. Bowman's leadership in our business community. Our next speaker is Vincent Jacopella. Vincent is the Executive Vice President of Growth and Strategy at Alba Wills App International, a privately held custom broker, freight forwarder, and global end-to-end -end supply chain management company. Vince has been working in the Trans-Pacific trade based in Los Angeles since 1987. If you're part of the California trade community, Vincent does not need an introduction. Our next speaker is Dolce Zagnisser. Dolce is a senior international trade specialist at the Virginia SBDC with nearly 30 years of international business experience, and she has worked in more than 40 countries. In addition to her role at SBDC, Dolce is also the managing director of Topath Group International a Virginia company that provides support to businesses expanding the presence in the global market. We also have today with us Marianne Roden. Marianne just completed her tenure at the American Association of Exporters and Importers, AAEI, on March 31st. Congratulations, Marianne. She served 12 years as president and CEO and four years at the, uh, at the Association General Council. Ms. Roden has an extensive background in international trade, including practicing law for over 20 years, 
and a concentration in international trade and transportation regulatory compliance and testifying before Congress on trade uh, legislation. Before we start the program, I am handing over the virtual floor to Erin Miller, the Virginia SBDC International Trade Director, our partner who's supporting in making this program possible. Erin, the virtual floor is yours. Well, thanks, Simona, and I'll, I'll keep it brief um, so we can get into this great content that uh, Ray and Vince and Dulcie and Marianne will be, be sharing with us. But, want to just uh, thank your leadership, Simona, helping us put these together and, and really seeing us uh, through and, um, you know, launching these, these programs. And to everybody who's been able to join in today, we're doing this as a service to our community of exporters and trade counselors around the country in a way to bring um, timely and insightful analysis, tools that you can apply uh, to your clients and your business uh, going forward and excited to have great partners in, in Los Angeles to do this with. So with that, I'm going to introduce my, my fellow colleague, uh, Dr. Ray Bowman, to take, take over here. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Aaron, for the introduction. Thank you, Simona. And thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this uh, this webinar. Um, I'm really excited uh, about this webinar because it includes um, three, three colleagues that, uh, that I really have a lot of respect for who have been around the trade community. And one of our goals today, or, or, or our goals for today is looking at what the trade trends are going forward, you know, un understanding what are the things we need to be concerned about as small businesses going forward in trade from, from a compliance lens, both import and export. And so the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna, I'm gonna ask the panelists some questions. And on each of the questions, we're gonna try to tell you why it's important, why you should be concerned about some of these trends or, 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 or have them in your crosshairs. Um, not only what to be concerned about or what to think about, but what should you do about these things? You know, as a trade professional, what actions, practical actions should you take? And then also too, we all know that part of implementing a strategy in anything that happens in trade also involves a whole host of supply chain partners, freight forwarders, customs brokers, trade attorneys, um, professionals uh, in the public sector. So we're going to try to try to connect it not only for what you should be doing, but how do you use your partners and what are some of the expectations you should have of your support or supply chain partners. So, so we're going to get right into it. And so the, the first question I have um, for our panelists is, you know, we, when we look at trade, you know, uh, a, a, a lot of years in trade were spent liberalizing trade, you know, trade liberalization was, was sort of the topic, you know, how can we facilitate trade? How can we make it easier to do business? And then in, in the last few years, you know, that, that trend has sort of changed. And so I, I'd like our panelists to sort of weigh in on that. So Given that, what are some of the current trends and challenges you're encountering as trade professionals? And, and what are some of the things that you want to share with our, our audience regarding that? You know, what, what are the things that are kind of jumping out in terms of trends? So um, I don't know if, uh, 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 Dulcy, if you'd like to talk a little bit about that first. Sorry, mute button is on. Um, well, thank you, Ray. And, and, and before I begin, I, I'm delighted to be here with Marianne and Vince today. And, and I, I credit Ray and Aaron with putting this program together and kind of envisioning this, this, uh, this, the, these sessions. So thank you. And Simona, thank you for your help as well. Um, with regard to current trends and challenges in, in trade, we're, we're seeing a lot of things. And I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a micro approach first with, you know, what are, what are companies seeing? Um, what are they, um, they, they experiencing in terms of their challenges? The orders are coming in. People want 
our products. People want American goods. People want um, our resources. So that's that's a great thing. But the problem is that our folks are um, facing a series of, of significant challenges. Um, and I'm going to break it down further because we have the new to export companies, the folks that have discovered that exporting is going to really help their bottom line and diversify their portfolio, and the new to and the experienced exporters that are facing things. So one of the big problems we're facing right now, and I think we'll cut right to the chase, is, is the su supply chain is, is constrained right now. I mean, we've all heard about the semiconductor problem. We know about raw materials. We know about um, various uh, constraints with regards to products leaving, leaving their home country to come to the States. Um, so that's, that's one of the problems is if you can't get your raw, your raw materials, you cannot get your product to your buyer. So there's an import and an export question right there. Um, some of the other things that are, are, are becoming problems, and, and not only is the supply chain from raw materials, but maybe you need specialized equipment, maybe you need something along those lines. Um, another challenge is that we have a lot of really brilliant um, uh, entrepreneurs in this country who are developing amazing new technology, emerging technology. Technology that might not be apparent, that it might be controlled, it might not be controlled. So that's a compliance issue in its own right in terms of the export side. Um, we're finding challenges with logistics. Um, you're having a tough time. I, I don't need to tell the California community about the ports, but obviously we're facing some challenges with, with the underbelly of airplanes too. The cargo, the cargo capacity isn't there and folks are, are finding some problems. Um, and then we're having some problems with importing countries and regulations. And I don't want to steal the thunder from the others because I know they're going to want to touch about it. I know we share many of the same concerns and considerations, even with the 301 duties and the, you know, the forced labor section 307 problems and IP protections. So there's a lot there. Um, the nice thing is trade is always going to be there um, and it is an organic thing that's constantly changing. It's like an amoeba and you, or a string and you push on in one direction, it's going to shift someplace else. So those are some of the, some of the considerations that, that um, we're, or problems and challenges that we're seeing. Um, and I do think that we also um, need to look at this if you want to look a little more granularly from an e-commerce versus uh, traditional trade items. Um, there are definitely, uh, shall I say, two by fours in the spokes um, because e-commerce is a very different animal than, 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 than traditional trade. And even when you're developing a website, um, you know, is that website going to be traditional trade or e-commerce? So we're, we're definitely seeing a lot of opportunities, a lot of challenges. Um, but there are solutions available um, uh, in terms of that. And I think the administration is certainly um, working to address some of these issues, um, which is helpful. Um, so I'm gonna to defer to my colleagues and maybe we'll have a conversation about all that. <laughs> well, and, 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 and this is a great way to tee it off because what I'll do is I'll have each of our panelists sort of weigh in on what they think the trends and then we'll let you all take, you know, just weigh in uh, uh, at once as a group as far as what we'll do, you know, what, where are some things we can do as well as, you know, our supply chain partners. So thank you for that. Um, uh, Vince. Thank you, Ray. Um, my, my, uh, my camera is not cooperating. I think with all the Zoom, I don't blame it at all for going on strike if it has, but, <laughs> but it has. So um, thanks. You know, uh, I try to say almost every challenge has an opportunity attached to it. Um, it's a little difficult on some of these challenges like port congestion and others, uh, infrastructure and trans-Pacific uh, uh, volume levels, uh, capacity levels. But the opportunity is that some of these systemic issues like uh, land use and equipment and ocean carrier policy, it is a good time to take a look at these things for the longer term and maybe uh, make some changes going forward. Um, obviously, um, if you want to balance imports and exports uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, there were issues uh, with uh, a huge shift in 2016 uh, with the de minimis raising from $200 to $800 on TIFTIA, Trade Facilitation and Trade Enforcement Act. Um, in 2016, a huge shift uh, from maybe what we call a legacy or older version of the supply chain to a newer version um, direct to consumer, um, 
And then obviously, if you put the China 301 duties on top of that, there was an acceleration towards that direct consumer and then the pandemic on top of that, right? Um, and then on top of that, as if that wasn't enough, on top of that, you had uh, all the all the Trans-Pacific capacity issues uh, that are happening. So uh, don't wanna paint a doom and gloom picture, but those are considerable challenges. Um, the, the green shoot is that uh, what my company saw and what we saw with the LA Chamber and other, other groups, the District Export Council of Southern California, groups that were looking at importers and exporters that some companies successfully pivoted, right? So if you pivoted to direct to consumer, um, if you were very agile and maybe you pivoted uh, to importing or exporting uh, personal protection equipment or, uh, you know, home and recreation, there are some green shoots there. Uh, we see customers that pivoted actually actually growing. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges for uh, small to medium sized enterprises with product in the US trying to get it to global markets, I think this equipment situation, um, uh, being able to get your product to the from where it's produced in the United States to where it's sold globally um, is something that, um, definitely needs to uh, needs attention uh, for US exporters that are struggling to get back on their feet. But I, I think I'll leave it with this and maybe turn it over back to Ray. Um, I would leave it with that. I think there are, uh, we've been in enough discussions collectively to know that there are remedies and mitigating factors for almost all of these challenges. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Ray. Great. So, um Given all that, Miriam, what's your take? Well, I, I look at it from a, a broader perspective. Um, having been an adjunct professor, you know, I'm I'm fascinated by different periods of periods of globalization, why they rise and why they end. You know, most people don't realize the last period of globalization was World War One, right before World War One. You know. Um, and I wrote an article back in 2017 for uh, the Adam Smith Project, which I believe was part of American Shipper, called Who Pays the Cost of the International System? And I said, there's three pillars. You know, obviously, we're in the post-World War II um, Pax Americana, right? So we have the U.S., it's three pillars the national security or global security umbrella. And that's obviously guaranteed by the US military, um, you know, augmented by NATO and other organizations. Um, and then there's the financial uh, system. Obviously the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. And in 2008, I think we really found out a lot, uh, which is that um, the lender of last resort is the US Federal Reserve. Um, and then the final piece of it, which I think started to fray earlier than people realized was the global trading system. And most people don't know that prior to the um, general uh, agreement on tariffs and trade, so the British empire had a system of preferences with their empire. So there, you know, the United Kingdom as a small island country always had more input to foodstuffs and stuff like that. And they were able to do that by their empire. So they had an imperial preferential system. And most people don't know that the bargain uh, between Winston Churchill and Federal, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt for the Lend-Lease program was an open trading system, okay? And um, so I talk about that in this article. But what has been clear to me for some time is that people have become more aware how much globalization touches their lives. Um, but I think so many people have mixed feelings about it. Globalization is what we did to other people, not what other people did to us. And, and I think it did start with the deindustrialization of the United States starting certainly in the 70s, the 1970s. And um, people are very, were very concerned for a long period of time of, you know, global trade. 
and the impact on the US manufacturing base. And that just accelerated. And I think the apex of that was the election of Donald Trump. So there were all of those things happening. So I always felt that this period of globalization was coming to an end because the US is paying all the costs of the international system, but we particularly economically are getting less and less of the benefit, at least the perception of American workers. And when you then combine you know, a free, market economy of the US with uh, countries like the European Union and Japan that have industrial policies. And then you have a country the size of China with state owned capital. It's almost, it almost broke the international system to a certain degree and it was just a matter of time. Wow. Well, and, and what I think is fascinating about the comments from all three of you is it all boils down to the international trade community and particularly small businesses. We've all had to reimagine our business models. You know, right. we've had to reimagine our supply chain, reimagine. I, I don't think I've talked to a single small business that didn't have to rethink their business model. And so given that, given, given these pressures in the supply chain and capacity, and, and, and sort of this, this, this trend uh, that Miriam described as a small business, what are some things we can do about that? What are, what are some things we should be doing? Can, can, I, can I jump in there, Ray, one sec? Sure, sure. Uh, so it's funny that um, unless there is some sort of major disruption, most people walk into stores and they grab stuff off shelves. They have no idea how they get there, right? <laughs> so, um, so I think Marianne hit on a thread there. I just want to, if you look at the last two themes of the LA World Trade Week uh, kickoffs, it was about, you know, in the best case scenario, in the best case scenario, the maybe individuals and some small businesses maybe don't understand global trade and the role that global trade plays. In the worst case scenario, folks are uh, either intimidated by it or, or uh, afraid of it, right? Or, or don't know a lot about it. So I think that a massive education program about, about, about the positivity of trading and exporting. And, and you know, I, I know I'm in the minority here, but there are some advantages to importing in some cases. Um, and then also, I think uh, trade policy, I, I, if I just say one thing about trade policy is that, you know, I think that when we talk about you know, getting out of China or things like that. I think we have to define what that actually means because what we're seeing is that things are moving out of Asia and then near shoring to Canada and Mexico, right? Um, as well as the United States. But bringing it back to SMEs, um, I think there is um, an opportunity for SMEs to plug in um, because of some of the disruption that's occurred. Um, and I think that, um, I really think it comes down to uh, I think Dulce touched on this in our prep. You know, I, I think it comes down to like having the right partners around you and using the right resources, leveraging SPDC, leveraging your broker forwarder, experts like Marianne. I, I, I think that um, going it alone is really tough, I think, <laughs> but surrounding yourself by folks. So I, I would just turn it over to that. And if I can jump in, and I agree with Vince on this, but one of the things that that with small businesses, there's the anxiety, the anxiousness to get into the market, and there's the anxiousness to kind of get in and make the sale. And we all understand, we applaud that. But sometimes it's a question of taking the time, especially in this environment where, where, where folks have had the opportunity to kind of look at the lay of the land and reestablish their business model, redesign it to adapt to this current market repurpose their, their, their products, their, their relationships. Um, we're now in a Zoom relationship economy. We're not doing that dinner. We're not having that drink with that party, that desired, that desired uh, uh, buyer. Um, so we need to redesign that relationship and we also need to redesign our supply relationship. And I think one of the problems that people are facing these days, especially with the supply chain is, some of these markets are more constrained. And so maybe you need to diversify your supply chain. Maybe you need to diversify your, your logistics supplier or your freight forwarders. Maybe you need to um, really kind of think about what it is you want to you wanna export and what you don't want to export. And I also think that people need to, and I think 
we in general have kind of politicized these to some degree, but the free trade agreements are really a great resource. And I think they're ignored often because we do look at that, that big player with China or that, and quite frankly, we never look at the emerging markets, which is an area that I love and want to nurture more. So um, that's my thought on that. Great. Well, and, 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 you know, one of the other things that, that I think we forget about in trade is one of the hallmarks of companies that are good in trade is that they're really good at innovating their business model, right? Because you have to do business with different countries. And so it forces you to constantly take fresh looks at, uh, you know, at, at your business model. So if there was ever a time to, to look at alternative sources, uh, different countries, um, you know, your free trade agreements. You know, we often talk about China. We forget that we have free trade with Korea, you know, those kinds of things, Canada, uh, right next door. So uh, this is an important time. So as far as your supply chain partners, how can they play a role in this? Um, you know, I often get small businesses that, you know, I ask about their supply chain partners and they go, oh, they were supposed to do that or, Gee, I didn't know that support was out there. So, so, so what are some ways that we should be using our support partners? Anyone? I could try. I was trying to give some airspace there. Um, so uh, um, I would, I, what I, you know, when we did the Export Connect programs on the West Coast um, uh, and, 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 and the, and the uh, Export Tech, uh, we told new to export folks, um, interview your partners as if you were interviewing like a like an employee, right? Um, there are 380 customs brokers in LA. Some do agriculture. Some are really good at agricultural chemicals. Some are good at apparel. Uh, ex that goes the same for exporting forwarders, right? So um, find someone who is uh, knows your your target market who has good representation in that market and um, is maybe scaled to the size you are. Um, maybe a really large provider, if you're a smaller SME, may not be the right fit for you. You might wanna to go to a smaller, more agile provider. Um, and I think obviously the most obvious role logistics folks play is we bring things from where they're made to where they're sold. And, and all along the way, um, I, but I think I, I was a kind of a cute statement, but I think, Ray, you're onto something where um, how much value is that partner adding as it goes through the chain, right? And um, I think it's more of a, it's even more uh, material for smaller SMEs because they don't have a legal department. You know, they don't have a, their own logistics department. Uh, they want a partner that's going to give them maybe online visibility to the shipment and not have to hire a person to track stuff. So I get, to, you know, that would be my takeaway. Would be that leverage all of your partners, your financial partners, your your your, your fulfillment, um, and, um, and and, and uh, you know, leverage their expertise and maybe pick the partner. Really do a deep deep discussion about the partner that fits with you. Yeah. Well, well, and also too, you know, just sort of a shameless plug for the SBDC program. We can really help support you if you have questions about your service providers or, or, or what's out there or what should you be asking. A lot of times we're in the role of helping the small business understand how to be better consumers of their supply chain partners. Um, so, so given all that, you know, we've just laid out this whole recommendation of looking at uh, new markets, new customers, rethinking the supply chain. So that kind of brings to the, the subject of, of sourcing. Um, so it's great to look at all of these different sources and different opportunities and possibilities, but there's also some compliance concerns with that. So as our audience of importers and exporters are looking uh, for new sourcing um, uh, and, and in this, given this new um, global supply chain, you know, uh, enforcement and what's going on, um, what are some things going on? What, what are some things we ought to think about when sourcing? So uh, Vince, I'm wondering if you can weigh in on this. Um. 
I'm interested to hear Marianne too, because we did a panel for AEI uh, just on Transpac, Trans-Pacific sourcing. It was really interesting because uh, what we were hearing from a lot of importers who had material investments in Asia on manufacturing were things like, you know, um, if I'm gonna source my product outside the US or vice versa, they wanted a three to five year strategy, right? Not not a 30 to 60 day strategy, right? So, so um, m- meaning, meaning that, hey, if I get out of China and I go to Vietnam, am I gonna have 301 duties in Vietnam a year later and I gotta get out of Vietnam and then two years later, I have to get out of Bangladesh? Like what is the overall trade strategy and it's a lot of them were saying, just tell us what it is and we'll, we'll, we'll try and align our business model to it. So I think that was a challenge in the past. Um, and then I always toy with Marianne as well. Like, I, I really like to hear what getting out of China means because, um, and, and her and I talked about this for a long time, um, that um, there's all these different thresholds. Does it mean that I'm doing business with a wholly owned Chinese subsidiary in Vietnam, right? Does it mean that we do, we, you know, so so we I think we have to define trade policy a little better uh, with a little clearer goals. And then especially large, I'm talking on the larger companies want a three to five year strategic plan. You know, are, are they gonna stay in the port of Long Beach? You know, are they gonna near shore uh, to Tijuana, like we do, which is starting, right? If they do leave Asia, they're not necessarily bringing light assembly back to Southern California. They're doing it in Tijuana and then we're crossing. And to add to the complexity, we're not even crossing in a duty paid environment. We're crossing now direct to consumer duty free, right? So, so, so um, if you look at all, I think all of these, these new emerging trends our opportunities, but I think Dulcie made the point as well that it's hard maybe to just get your arms around them all by yourself, right? Um, and, and you have to leverage companies that are that are there and doing it. Um, so the sort the transpack sourcing, you know, um, I see a lot of shifts. I see I do see uh, shifts out of China. Um, I, I haven't seen the shift to Central America that was anticipated. Due to the to the due to the um, I think Central America is really good at T-shirts and uniforms and other other things, um, but I, and I also haven't seen yet the one country I thought would give China a run was India, but you know when you talk to uh, folks, you know there's infrastructure, communication, transportation, power, you know. Uh, power, there's all this infrastructure that needs to be built. So so uh, I think the jury's still out. I think, I, I don't know, I open it up to Dulce and, and Marianne, I don't see yet a, an alternative uh, that could take the China production capacity, that could absorb all of China production capacity yet. Um, not to say it won't happen in the future, but I just don't know if you're a big box store retailer and you have huge runs. Um, you know, I think China still has um, is is really uh, one of very few options there. Maybe changing over time, but that's just what I see. Yeah. Well, I I'd, I'd love to hear Dulcie's take on this because she works with a lot of clients in emerging markets. So, um, love to get your opinion on that. Yeah, and and. <laughs> You know, it's 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 a it's a it's an interesting question because you can look at this from the supply chain side of this, or you can look at this from the compliance side. Um, you know, and it really does boil boil down to you know obviously your desires, and you know if you're picking China as your sort as your market for contract manufacturing or something like that, and and it's a very sophisticated product and they can turn around quickly. How do you ship that? So I'm gonna take that off the table for me and just literally talk about the compliance side of things. And I think one of the things that is important for importers to look at from from the compliance side is their own um, internal uh, compliance program that can dictate their relationship with their supplier and their on the importing side. Um, I think that if you are looking at um, a internal controls system that will help you 
identify and manage the risks of that, the, of that sourcing. Um, it might be raw materials out of West Africa. It could be you know, something, uh, a key input into your manufactured product. Um, you need to know pretty much the life cycle of that, of that product, where it comes from, how it's manufactured, um, and be able to demonstrate to CBP that it meets all of the regulations. And I think that manufacturers, you know, they hear about the export compliance side of things, but they don't necessarily take the reasonable care that's required in the, regula in the CBP regulations. Um, uh, the Mod Act of 1993 said, you importer are responsible for understanding where you're sourcing your product. Um, and so that has to inform what markets you actually go into to source. Um, and this actually parries with the export compliance side of it. If you are going to import raw materials into your product and then you're going to export your product out, you need to know the entire compliance package. You need to have regulation or you need to have um, uh, compliance procedures and internal practices to protect you, but also to possibly allow you. And this fa accurately factors in beautifully into your business model, how you assess who you want to do business with. Um, so I do think that that's important. I may be deviating a little bit from your question, but I do think it's, it's really important. And there are partners and we as SBDC can help our small business community um, identify some of those risks, educate people so that they know how to find the right markets, how they can build that internal program, because trade is a steep learning curve. And especially with small businesses, if you don't understand those responsibilities on the importing side with the compliance side and the exporting side with the compliance side, I do think that you, you end up actually um, impacting your, your bottom line at the end of the day. A compliance program can help you strengthen your bottom, bottom line because it can help you fit, pick the right partners, the right markets. Um, and so I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now. I'm sure Marianne has a lot to say. I see her shaking her head. So. <laughs> Um, oh, uh, I'm sure Miriam has nothing to say on the topic of sourcing. <laughs> Please take it, Miriam. Well, you know, um, touching back on what we've been talking about, realize that um, the reason we were in that trade liberalization period is not only U.S. global security, but the invention of the container, okay? And it made for very efficient supply chain, right? And for particularly for multinational corporations and the global trading system, the GATT and then the successor, obviously the WTO based on rules of origin is perfectly suited for multinational corporations. It is not as well suited for small businesses. Okay. So this shift was starting um, for a while, and, and even for CBP and other government agencies, you know, all they had to do was regulate, uh, pay attention to the top 1,000 importers and exporters, which import and export over 70% of the goods in the United States, okay? So that's a very stable environment. When e-commerce first came up, I read a report, it was done for eBay, and this was when the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership with the European Union was just starting. And the Obama administration, I think because of criticism uh, from uh, consumer groups and others that were skeptical about international trade, free trade, uh, they were demanding more access, more openness. So we did a series, both the TPP and TTIP of stakeholder presentations. So you would have Friends of the Earth, and then you would have us and NAM, you know, in the US Chamber. And um, when I read the report and it was designed for TTIP and TPP, it was written from the e-commerce platform perspective of something like Globalization 2.0 and having it more user-friendly for small businesses. And I thought to myself, well, if they think they're gonna have one set of trade rules for e-commerce and another set of trade rules for multinationals, forget it. And so I'm embarrassed to say that it took me a while to really understand that shift that was happening. And I realized that that shift was happening 
because for e-commerce platforms that were not taxed and regulated, when you go onto a platform, you are a consumer looking for that seller. It turns everything on its head that a normal small business would have to do to engage in global trade, which is if I can access foreign markets, I got to find some buyers. And so going back to the last question, you need a CEO who is really committed to expanding into foreign markets. And that's a huge commitment. E-commerce may flip that all on its head and say, the buyers will come to you, right? And the second reason why it's the e-commerce took off um, is because it's a sale first and foremost. Most people don't go online unless you're, you know, trade nerds like us and look at the country of origin or where something is from, right? You're not even aware of it. So whether that purchase is an import or export is secondary and handled behind the scenes. And that's when we started to integrate uh, e-commerce. We were fortunate enough to get many of the uh, platforms uh, as members of the association. And that's when I became, um, you know, the co-chair of the e-commerce work group at the WCO. Um, so that shift was already happening. And of course, that totally changed the supply chain. Um, and you had the mail service, you had the courier services. And so the lowering of those costs dramatically opened up um, the possibilities for SMEs in global trade and made it much more efficient. But go, to go back to this most recent question of production shifting, you know, modern China could not exist with a country like without the size of the United States. No country is big enough to absorb the production capacity of China. So going to Vince's uh, comments, we've gone back and forth and AI did some studies or surveys over the years with Amber Road, which is now owned by E2Open on e-commerce, use of technology, but also production shifting. And I started to do a series of webinar, uh, not webinars, but presentations. I would go out and talk to small associations. And I would ask people a series of these questions about production. And people with a multinational corporation just wanted more information because they didn't really know what to do. And this is over the last three years. So I have learned that after questioning people, China has certain unique characteristics. The size of China and their manufacturing base is just perfectly suited to the United States. And remember, we started this in the late 70s of you know, investment in China and providing technical expertise because it took a long time to get the quality standards and things like that up. And the dirty little secret that many of us know that most people don't know is all that talent, that trade talent for China, that was Hong Kong. The Chinese needed the people in Hong Kong who have been trading for a hundred years to teach them how to do this. So China has three you know, unique characteristics, the large production capacity of being a large country that engineering um, technical expertise for standards. And I'm talking about technical standards of engineering standards and product quality standards. And the third thing that China has, which is really unique, they have that first class logistics. They, just like Africa using the cell phone, you know, doesn't have to worry about landlines. China was able to leapfrog and build, you know, because they have a, a, uh, a government of engineers that can impose their will. Mm -hmm. They were able to build a world-class logistics system with the latest technology in a way that a country like India, which is a fractious democracy, just cannot. And so that's what makes it so difficult to figure out um, alternatives to China. 
because they have those three unique characteristics. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Well, and, and, and I think what, what we've really touched on for our small businesses listening in is, and, and I get this on the domestic side because we, we work with a lot of different businesses, not only in international, but just domestic topics. But, you know, a pro, one of the problems in international I see domestically is that most regulations seem to be configured for larger companies to figure out, right? We, we, we have all these different regulatory schemes. And if you're a big company and you've got a legal department, a compliance department, you can figure it out, right? And, and you have that baked into your structure for a small business to figure out compliance, whether it's domestic, you know, how do I set up a factory in this city? Uh, you know, how do I uh, meet health requirements, product safety standards? But then you have this whole other layer on the international side that's even less accessible than the stuff you had problems with domestically. So what, what can our audience do about better plugging in or, or or having some, some system of, of being able to tap into some of these compliance issues when they're looking at new sources. If I, if I could, Ray, um, I wanna to touch on your question. So if you look at e-commerce over the last two years, and our company was really a part of the Customs and Border Protection initiatives, as were others, um, we have more advanced data. We have more data requirements on e-commerce than we did before. It's not perfect, but we have more. Uh, we have ways to route shipments to other agencies like Food and Drug and FDA through entry type 86 and other type things. Um, the, 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 the flip, on one side, it's, it makes it more accessible in a compliant way for an SME. On the other side, the point that I think everybody's made on the panel is that right now, um, the same rule, the same rules apply to the SME as to the large company. So not having the infrastructure to comply or not having, you know, the, the knowledge to comply is not, you know, according by the Mod Act uh, of 1993, as Dulcie mentioned, it's, it's, it's not an excuse, right? You have to know. Interestingly enough, if you don't do a consumption entry and you go to de minimis, right? Um, a lot of that, uh, there is no importer legally. Right and 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 um, a lot of the stuff in the Mod Act doesn't apply. Well, it applies by statute, but may not apply regulatory wise. So I guess the high level for SMEs, I'll leave you with this, is that if there are way there are ways that are mandated by customs right now in which you have to supply more data, and you have to make those shipments subject to other like FDA if they're subject to FDA. There are certain shipments that are not eligible. For direct to consumer that should not be going direct to consumer, right? That still do not as much as before, but still do intellectual property, national security restrictions, uh, valuation. Is it a below, a below, a below or below eight hundred dollars per day per consumer? So, um, but the good news is that I think there are enough folks out there that uh, a broker, a folder, you know. Um, there are enough folks out, Filer, which would be a broker. There are enough folks out there that know those regulations and can guide you through it, right? Like I would never try and figure that out on my own. Um, um, so I, I think uh, I just wanted to put it out as a resource for SMEs. Well, and, and, and to kind of add to that a little, just from my own observations, I can't tell you how many small businesses I've talked to haven't actually had a conversation with their freight forwarder, their customs broker, their trade attorney about regulations. You know, a lot of times it's, hey, I've got this order, it needs to go here. But it's it's really important to look at your products and services and, and, and just have a conversation about that. Can I just jump in on that? Because I, I really feel very strongly about this. Um, yeah, definitely the on the import side, the SMEs are definitely not not necessarily um, um, becoming well educated on that side. But I also want to caution the SME whether you're in e-commerce or whether you're following the traditional trade route, you still have to get very smart on the buyer's market. 
Um, I have come across a number of e-commerce folks who are selling a uh, product into Canada, for instance, and all of a sudden their goods are getting stopped at the border. You know, they're sending a small bottle of something that might be consumable, but it's so small and price tag is so cheap that they don't think that they have to get it past regulations in Canada with regard to Health Canada. Or they don't have to. They don't have to meet certain um, uh, Canadian uh, radio frequency or whatever because it's a minor. They they view it as a minor product. Canadian government does not. Uh, EU same problem. Um, so you do have to find um, somebody who can help you be compliant on the U.S. side, no matter whether it's a controlled product that you're shipping out, whether it's something controlled coming in, whether you have to deal with the EPA or you have to deal with the FDA or, or what FCC, um, but also making sure that you are so smart on the, on the market because that can be a very costly self-inflicted wound if you don't pursue um, uh, the proper compliance and, and bring in the right kind of, if you need that advisory package, it is okay to ask for help and it is encouraged to ask for help. Um, it, it just, it, it can really, um, when, when y'all were talking earlier about the, 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 the regime, the trade regime, yes, the rules are the same whether they're a big business or a small business, but the fines are the same as well and the penalties are the same as well. They don't graduate like, oh, you're a small business and you've made a small mistake and you know, it doesn't work that way. So you really do have to be, small business I think has to be smarter, more nimble, more informed, and more um, applicable in terms of implementing those compliance activities. I, I would just add that, um, I guess, uh, self-criticism in a way, um, and it just kind of created over time. You know, like so many specialty areas, we're the victims of our own success on a certain level, but complexity, that is the problem. So the joke in our family, and I think all of us have the same joke, you know, when I graduated law school and I wanted to go into national trade and I started a transportation, became a transportation lawyer, my parents thought, okay, you know, trains, planes, automobiles, whatever. You know, they just knew I didn't do anything that was helpful, you know, real estate, trusted states, you know, to do their will. And then when I switched over to international trade, um, they're like, Okay, now you know NAFTA had just uh, came into being, and they're like, okay, whatever. And then many years later, um, so so I was sort of like an oddity, and they didn't really know what I did for a living. And um, this was during the Bush administration when we had the melanin issue uh, with China, and I, I met with uh, the secretary of HHS, and I was talking to my mother, and she said just sort of added a blue, she says, you know, I didn't buy fish at the supermarket because it didn't have a country of origin label. And I knew, you know, if my mother, you know, after osmosis of talking about this over the years, she was becoming very aware. And I think that has happened um, over the last several years. So um, the problem for e-commerce or SMEs in general, is complexity. And again, that has accreted over time. Just think of after 9-11, all the supply chain security stuff. I started as a transportation attorney. I never, you know, security was loss and damage claims. I never thought we would have CBP as the primary um, regulatory agency regulating the global supply chain. And then getting other countries to do, to, you know, agree to do that because of national security purposes. And then you have the product safety stuff. And now we have, you know, the ESG, the forced labor, all the non-tariff stuff. And that has just bred enormous complexity. So for SMEs, I think you have to have a couple things in mind. You have to be committed to doing it. Having a plan consulting with some experts, keeping it simple. And it's all about risk management. I think we will start to see somewhat of a revolution in our area to manage that complexity. Because right now it's very people intensive. So, you know, all of us on, our, on this panel, we've got like 20 years of experience. 
I taught law students, you know, or they were getting their master's in law. We taught, in, you know, U.S. import export law. And it takes about five years to learn this stuff. So for a business person, my advice is, you know, just know what you need to run your business. Why is the harmonized tariff schedule important? You don't need to know everything, but you need to know what is my product classified as? You just need to know about value. You just need to know basics about export controls so that you can run your business and, and get that risk management. Well, and, and, and that's great advice because, you know, what we forget is understanding compliance, understanding these rules, how it applies to your business gives you a business advantage. I know we have a lot of clients whose advantage in the market is their ability to understand these things. And, and again, there's lots of help out there to help you navigate this. So one of the things we've alluded to that we can't, you know, have a session like this without is the whole subject of e-commerce because, you know, we thought trade was liberalized before, and now we have sort of this e-commerce that sort of democratized trade, right? There are tiny businesses, and if they have a website or if they're on a platform of some kind, whether it's you know Alibaba or, or if it's Amazon or Etsy or wherever, they're realizing that now they're open up to the world. At the same time, we've already talked about or alluded to the fact that hey, there's different rules on this sort of small package world that are slightly different than, you know, what we call traditional trade. And, 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 and so now we have these two worlds colliding, this, this huge pipeline of these, these, you know, small package deliveries, you know, uh, I mean, before this pandemic, a few of us were, you know, getting stuff online, having it delivered. Uh, now, literally, I live in a quiet street and, you know, Amazon, UPS, they're all just crisscrossing, you know, my street and delivering. So um, tell us a little bit more about, um, and I'll, I'll have Vince start off, but tell us a little bit more about what this world is, what it means to us I, as a small business. I, 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 Ray, I think that is uh, absolutely one of the central things to discuss for SMEs because, you know, back in April and May of 2020, when we were gaming inside our company strategically, um, a lot of to, 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 to the understatement in April of 2020 is the word uncertainty, right? There was a lot of uncertainty, right? Uh, we had customers with 60% demand shock. Uh, we we had customers with supply shock. Um, we, had, we had customers that had liquidity issues, like never worse than 2017, worse than 2008. Um, um, worse than 2009. Uh, so we were just, everybody was like, okay, where is everything going? And the one trend that emerged when, when, we, when we gamed out strategically, those customers that were doing better, those companies that were doing better, um, and, and, and some have told me, hey, you know, Vince, this was always like this, but I, I just have to say, I saw a big change. The method of delivery actually became part of the product value, right? So the delivery wasn't, the delivery wasn't like, oh, I've, I've built this product, I've marketed it. Uh, I'm gonna sell this pair of sneakers for X amount of dollars. I have a market lined up. Oh, by the way, how do I get it to that consumer or to, to a distribution center? That doesn't work, that, that doesn't work anymore. When you're designing that product now from the start, you have to envision how you're going to get it to that consumer. And, and if you're going to brick and mortar, this, this same phone, which I'm holding up with no camera, but <laughs> this same phone um, that, that, that you can, this, this phone could be priced differently in brick and mortar now than if it's online. A pair of tennis shoes, if you're back East sneakers, right? But in the West Coast tennis shoes, a pair of tennis shoes, um, you know, in, in brick and mortar is cheaper. That same pair is way cheaper than if I'm, if it's showing up on my front porch, right? So I really believe that now the distribution channel is actually part of the product. It's actually 
an integral part of the product, right? And that was my biggest takeaway on, on, on those companies that were pivoting. Um, and it doesn't mean it has to come in on de minimis. We have a lot of customers that still come in the old way, paying duty, all the, all the regular, you know, consumption entry. And then it goes to a distribution center and they go to direct to consumer from there. So um, I, I think the challenge would be, which is also an opportunity is that if I'm an SME and I'm either, I have to get in, I, I want my product in a foreign market or I want a product here, you know, I'll give a little bit of a shout out to big commerce companies like big commerce like that, that have online marketplaces overseas, right? Um, they might be able to get you into an online marketplace in the Philippines or an online marketplace overseas or any expert, right? Um, how am I actually getting my product in a country that might be locked down, for instance, or temporarily or whatever? So I, to me, that was my biggest takeaway of what's different, um, you know, for SMEs and maybe think through the whole supply chain all the way through when you're even envisioning the product is what I would say. Um, I'd like to move to Dulce, but uh, before, before I do, I just want to remind our audience to please go to the Q&A uh, to post your questions and, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, specific to the things that we've mentioned or other compliance questions you have, please feel free to post those. Uh, but Dulce? Oops. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, with e-commerce, e-commerce is... is is really such a fascinating um, opportunity. It's almost like the the uh, the early stages of of sales back in like the 1800s when when people were just kind of setting up a shop and starting to ship and creating opportunity. And we're we're facing that in a completely kind of a Jetson period. I mean, it's like now it's all modernized, and mechanized. I think the thing that is is really interesting with the folks that I've spoken to in e-commerce who are kind of really pushing through into an international market is I can sell anywhere and they're willing to take certain risks. And that is, is I think one of, one of the challenges. They haven't really thought through the foreign exchange side of it. They haven't thought about how am I gonna get it through customs? You know, A lot of them all of a sudden their stuff is piling up in Bulgaria because they can't get it through customs because they don't know how to provide the proper paperwork or they haven't shipped it in the correct method. Um, so I consider e-commerce a little bit like the wild west right now. We're, we're still trying to figure out um, how to how to play within the rules, but how to stretch those rules to maximize our ability to make a sale. Um, a lot of a lot of the e-commerce folks, I'm also finding our diaspora, who are now saying, "Hey, I have a natural market. I can sell into Lebanon. I can sell into Bulgaria. I can sell into into Guatemala or El Salvador." Um, and I think that that's you know, I I know people. I know how to get it into the country. Um, and that can, that can be a great thing. It can also create serious trade challenges. Um, what happens if you're sending things maybe that you don't have a license to send? What happens when you don't have, um, uh, you know, the proper marks or something along those lines? What happens if you actually don't have a license to distribute in that market? So there are definitely challenges that I think e-commerce is going to face quickly in terms of kind of the, the one-off mom and pop type operation. From an e-commerce perspective, from an, uh, from an established business, I really think that they're going to find that over time that this platform is going to morph into the more traditional, traditional um, uh, trading system because it, it's going to have to. I don't, I don't see, I think world trade usually evolves over time based on, based on certain pressures. Um, and that pressure is going to build eventually where there's going to have to be a more formalized e-commerce um, uh, mechanism to make it easier and more understandable. But the one thing I caution every small business on is, again, you, you've got to know the rules. You've got to know how to make this work for you because you're in it to make money. You're in it to make a profit. Uh, the regulations are created that maybe you're not going to be able to do that if, if you have challenges. So um, I think it's, it's risk and reward and managing and it's, an, it's a balancing act to try and, and, and make it an effective, effective tool for expanding your business. Um, well, 
And, yeah. and before we go to Miriam, because I know we're, we want to leave some time for questions, but one of the things I loved is one, one of the things you've kind of couched is this whole idea that it, that e-commerce is the wild west. I mean, it, it, it's exploded so quickly. It's become, you know, a, a huge part of, of trade. And at the same time, it's one of these things where you overregulate it, you kill it, you don't regulate it, you will equally kill it. And, and, and so given that, and, and, and given how glacial countries move in terms of their regulations, uh, I, I, I think you've really, you really kind of, of, of positioned that, that dilemma there. So, so given that dilemma, Marian, um, what do you see? Well, you know, I was watching uh, the trade statistics, you know, for many years, you know, as any good trade nerd does. Um, and coming out of the financial crisis, global trade, containerized global trade was flat. Okay? It wasn't growing. And I started seeing the statistics early on um, about e-commerce growing so much. It was like 15 to 20%. And so we had you know, a couple of platforms as members. We had all the express air couriers. And AEI had a seat on uh, what's called the World Customs Organization's Private Sector Consultative Group. And it's sort of like the advisory committee to the secretary general of the WCO. And that was started um, because of the authorized economic operator program after 9-11. And uh, so we had that seat for, for since 2006, I guess. And I was going to the meetings in Brussels and I started seeing these issues and talking to our members. And I brought it to the PSEG and I said, we as the private sector have got to push the WCO to deal with this um, because there was just too many arbitrary decisions being made by various countries. Now, the WTO um, had did some in initial work, um, as did the WCO. Australia and New Zealand in particular had put papers forward um, on what they were seeing. And we were fortunate because um, we had an American uh, by the name of Ana Hinojosa from USCBP get elected to uh, the WCO Director of Trade Facilitation and Compliance. Now that's traditionally an American seat to begin with. It had previously uh, been a Chinese candidate. Uh, but when Ana got elected, and I knew her a little bit through CBP, and when I saw her, I said, e-commerce, she said, absolutely. And that's what she really took up. Um, and that was also, you know, the WCO is, is not technically part of the United Nations international bodies, but it's sort of like a sister organization. They kind of include it by default, but it's actually a membership driven association of customs administrations. And the customs administrations were worried about the tsunami of packages. So we tried to do the first framework or standard. So I had a privileged perch to see what was going on. And that e-commerce was growing 20% a year. And, you know, there were a couple of issues, you know, with definitional issues, how do you define e-commerce? And in the background, the WTO was gonna start its e-commerce negotiations. So we did a framework of standards within a three year period for, an international organization, that's like lightning speed. And it's a non-binding agreement that has technical specifications, framework of standards, definitions. So it's a nice package. Um, but what they really failed to do is come up with a risk management system. And I think it's because there was an odd juxtaposition. E-commerce is an export platform. It is. But you had government entities that were import oriented looking at it. And so that's why it was such an odd situation. Now we saw these trends just accelerating. And then, you know, you had the Trump administration coming in with their section 301 tariffs and trying to confront China. Um, and my co-chairs at each of the three years was very interesting. First, it was Australia. 
they were really dealing with the problem. They were dealing with it from a VAT perspective. They were losing a lot of the uh, value added tax. The, my co-chair for the second year was China. They already had a separate supply chain, specific supply chain dedicated to e-commerce. You have to have a special tax number. You know, it is regulated separately and they actually have a separate statute dealing with e-commerce. And then my third co-chair was from Canada. And this poor guy was dealing with now truckloads of because we had raised, US had raised a de minimis for the US e-commerce was becoming an import platform rather than an export platform. So he was dealing with container loads of e-commerce shipments consolidated so that he had 80,000 ma 80, manifests to process within a particular uh, you know, container load. What I never anticipated, and I knew e-commerce would keep growing because trade and transportation are like water. They're gonna find the most efficient route. I never anticipated something like a pandemic to accelerate all those underlying trends. And the only supply chain that withstood a pandemic was the e-commerce supply chain. And so that's where we find ourselves today. Now, it, the e-commerce shipments, what we call the type 86 interest, the uh, entries of those, uh, you know, uh, informal entries um, that we use for e-commerce, they have eclipsed volume-wise the more traditional container type one consumption uh, entries. So customs knows they have a problem. And e-commerce is going to keep driving the bus. And now we're just grappling with how do we manage those compliance issues and scale it for SMEs that are using what we call the omni-channel or the e-commerce supply chain. And don't forget, a big component of that is the mail service. A lot of it is coming through mail. And so the mail uh, system is really governed by a separate treaty and international organization called the Universal Postal Union, which predates all the other um, uh, international bodies. I think it was started in the 1880s, 1890s, something like that. So they're also based in Geneva and we actually work with them. They were actually sent delegates to our WCO e-commerce meetings and they were coming up with the data set electronically for the postal services to use. And that's actually kicking in now that can help customs administrations get advanced data and do some risk management on these e-commerce shipments. But that's where we are today, you know, grappling with the regulatory compliance side with the SMEs. We can't ask them to be, you know, e-commerce companies to be trade experts. But we can do is do a better job of isolating what is really important for compliance purposes. What are the real risks? Yeah, well, and, and uh, we'll go to questions in a second, but you know, I, I remember Fried Zakaria, economist and, and uh, uh, columnist, you know, in 2007, he was talking about trade being one of the biggest developments in, in history in the last hundred years. And, and that was before the e-commerce explosion. And, and now here's this other quantum leap. So at, at this point, I wanna leave some, some room for some questions. We do have a few questions. And Simona, if you could uh, read some of those questions that we're getting. Yes, speaking of managing e-commerce compliance issues, we have a question. What do you think the best method is for selling directly to individuals internationally? Our company provides a training solution comprised of hardware and software. And the main issue we run into is unknown custom fees once the package arrives in the destination country. Are there resources I can use to find the exact or estimated tariffs to then include these in the initial cost to the customer rather than them being charged later from their local customs office? Can I take a stab at that if I could? Sure. Yeah, so I think this is what the, the, the number one hidden dilemma that 
Um, most e-commerce discussions is about imports, right? And and on exports, if it's under twenty five hundred dollars, there's actually no AES declaration required. And there's lots of stuff that could happen in that space. There could be export controls. There could be license cargo. There could be dual use issues. All these issues that and and most of the companies in the U.S that are facilitating this are not compliance companies. They're basically forwarders that are that are focused on small package. I was approached with this use case by a couple of online platforms. And the data is striking because we've all talked about cross-border on sourcing, but we really haven't talked yet about cross-border when the actual sale takes place at a smaller level. So that the percentage is uh, business.com has some great data from, from July about about the percentage of cross-border sales after it, fr fr the, the last sale, the last mile sale is now cross-border, right? So it's not like I bring it into the U.S. and I sell within the United States. I bring it into the U.S. Now I'm selling to Canada, Mexico, other countries. So that question about the duties has come up. Here's the problem as I see it with maybe one solution. Um, the problem as I see it that in the old days uh, when that was a a B2B transaction, business to business transaction. Um, the origin business would have gone to their broker or forwarder or an attorney in the destination and gathered that data about what the duty is, what the what the duty rates are, what the VAT is. And they would have hopefully, although I've seen that not done, they would have hopefully rolled that into the unit price of the product, right? Or they would have sold to a, a port term and all of that would have been to the account of the of the buyer, right? But now, as Marianne pointed out, none of those folks are involved, right? So this is directly, you know, B to C, business to consumer, or C to C, consumer to you know, consumer to consumer, constantly to consumer. So, so what happens is, um, at this point, I get calls all the time. We price this out. We have sixteen units. They go to Australia. Uh, I have to pay that. I didn't know I had to pay that. The online the online platform didn't tell me anything about that, um, so it is a hold. And uh, you know, I the one thing I see happening is that I see some online folks partnering with uh, shipping companies that have more information about that and trying to build it in based on the destination country. I also see companies going to the website of the foreign customs service. Right. And I don't think this is ideal, but it's it's a, it's a push going to the website of the Foreign Customs Service and then actually looking up the duty rate and and adding it to their price. So uh, I think this is uh, a huge pain point. And, um, you know, I don't know if that was helpful or not. You know, there are online systems that are out there. Um, I, I don't want to endorse any one of them, um, but you know, one of the websites you can go to is like export-connect.org and they have different companies that have calculators on there and they also have uh, systems um, to assist you. So I think you're gonna see, we're gonna see a revolution within the next couple of years of the sophisticated online systems, whether it's part of a platform or not, maybe independent as, as Vince was talking about, that, that will help you a lot, um, small businesses a lot. Again, part of that risk management, if we can take it off the hands of people, because even in the international trade space, there are a few uh, very large global trade management companies. And we've witnessed it since the dot-com era, you know, get more and more consolidated and become more sophisticated. The problem with these systems is you have to be a knowledgeable trade person to use them. And that makes the learning curve so steep and the costs of, you know, are fairly high, even if they're a subscription model. So we really need to take what we know and really scale it for the SME um, e-commerce business. Uh, my comment, I, I echo all, uh, both Vince and Marianne on this, but I, you know, in terms of the immediate situation, um, it is so imperative that exporters understand, un, I'm sorry, exporters understand their, uh, their harmonized system code. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I see small businesses who don't have a relationship with a freight forwarder, don't have a relationship with a customs broker, 
you know, don't know what to fill out on the paperwork. And you do, in, at the end of the day, e-commerce exporters, regular exporters need to know the basics. And, you know, taking a class through an SBDC program or doing something like that just to understand your minimum obligations before you export will really kind of break the back in terms of those, those hangups. Um, it also uh, will at least open up your eyes to um, whether you have to have a business registration in that market or whether you have to pay VAT or whether, you know, there's a threshold for VAT or whatever. So, um, you know, there are resources, especially in the SBDC system to help people understand some of the basics that they need to understand about their product. And then they can have an informed conversation even with a service provider. The last thing you wanna do is have a conversation with a service provider and go, I don't know, tell me what I'm supposed to do. Sometimes that really doesn't help your cause. <laughs> so. Well, and that service provider is only as good as the information you give them. So exactly. So you. You can't just say, well, I've hired someone to do this. You really have to take ownership over your own products and services. Um, we have another question, Simona? I, actually, I would like to do a follow-up with this question to make sure we, um, we covered, um, and this is for Vince. Vince, do you think in terms of price strategy, it is wise to include the foreign tariffs in the final price to customer, or should you have it as a separate fee for that particular country? So, so that is a very good question. And it might, it might vary depending on who your destination country is. So one thing we didn't talk about outside of duty was um, compliance. So um, you might have a product that is subject to FDA in that country or regulated no matter what the value, right? Um, there could, uh, you'll see, uh, rec uh, talked about uh, having a distributor for that international property brand, maybe already in that country. So um, the calculators and stuff won't do, most of them will not do that, right? So um, I think the, the dilemma has been, and I'm trying to give you a short answer, and there's no short answer on this. The dilemma has been that the customer wants door to door. They want last mile in that destination country, right? Mm -hmm. But in many countries like Mexico, right? Um, you can't have a non-resident uh, import. The, the, the importer has to be a resident company in Mexico, right? Or the seller has to have some sort of structure in Mexico to, to enter. So, um, and then there are some with, with USMCA, there are exceptions for e-commerce now carved out. But my point is that um, we recommend on B2B, and don't forget, we're all B2B people, DNA, right? Our DNA is real business to business still. We recommend, hey, you know what? You could deliver all the way to the door, but maybe you don't want to get in, in, into the duty and VAT business in that destination country because that buyer's broker, when they used to be a business there, has the expertise about multi-agency entry, about valuation, about the lowest legal that facilitative that legal valuation you could be paying more so um I, I know as marianne alluded to that there are uh things popping up on the internet there are companies advising platforms on this there are platforms buying brokers uh customs brokers there are platforms partnering with brokers right um to try and give more of this coverage i could tell you um i'll i'll, I'll finish with this there's what we want and there's what the consumer, the, the buyer wants, right? And the buyer doesn't want to get a duty bill. And the buyer doesn't want to hear that your package is at Sydney airport and we can't get it to, it's only two miles from your house. It came, it came halfway across the world, but it's at Sydney airport for five days and it can't get, you know, the last five miles, right? So I think you're going to see Simona, um, some sort of, uh, and, 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 you know, our company's, uh, beta testing a couple of things, a couple of uh, vehicles, you're going to see a, 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 a through to the door price and system that does include those costs. Um, if you're coming in under a certain de minimis amount, which in other countries is much lower than ours, right, with the exception of Australia, um, which now the VAT is not excluded in Australia, but the duties are. Um, so you know, you, if you have a $45 de minimis or $50 de minimis, you know, you'll might come in under a de minimis where there is no duty, right? 
but most countries do not have the de minimis threshold that we have, which is $800. So it is material sometimes. Thank you, Vincent. Um, that was very helpful. Also too, just uh, respecting everyone's time because it, in the new world of Zoom, now we have even less time between our meetings. So I wanna respect everyone's time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have uh, room for one more question, Simona. Yes, and this is on behalf of all small business uh, <laughs> clients who only have one person running businesses. So it's, thank you for this question. If I can't afford to hire someone to handle international business development, yet I have the desire to expand globally, what's the best route? I would, th this is the advice that I would, I would give people. Uh, you know, AEI has a, um, you know, an online system for membership, but also contact us forms. And I can tell you every day we would get an email from a company saying, I want to sell garlic. I want to do this. I want to do that. And the I, I actually typed up in MS Word um, a standard response because we were getting so many inquiries. And, you know, traditionally, a lot of companies say, well, let me see if I can get a buyer or a list of buyers in a particular country. And I, my response was always the same. Go to one of the more established e-commerce platforms. Start out with one product, one country, if you can, depending on what kind of buyers you get, um, and start simple. Just because they do have the logistics infrastructure infrastructure pretty well done. They vary in terms of their compliance, but they're working on it now. Um, that's the way to start. Um, I think it's the least risky for small businesses. Um, what I would put out there is there are so many, I, I mean, when I look at when I started in trade in 1982, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't go on the internet and go Google, you know, trade. Um, even the major documents for trade, you know, were subscription based, and you spent a lot of money to get a hold of these uh, these assets. Now there's so many good um, uh, support systems. There's the District Export Council, which are trade professionals who volunteer to help people get into trade. There's uh, export.gov. There's the SBDC system, which has had uh, a, a push nationwide to make sure that every state has someone who's addressing trade. Um, so I would say there are so many free resources. We can plug you into a lot of those to kind of think through your strategy and, and, and kind of what your intentions are, what your goals are with getting into global markets. And, and the nice thing is too, is a lot of times we get companies that are so new as companies, we have to work on the company first before we can work on the import or export strategies. So I would definitely say, you know, your, your tax dollars are paying for us to provide you these services please use them, you know, there's a whole host of networks and, and there's no bad phone call, right? If, if you call an SBDC, we're plugged into SBA, we're plugged into US Department of Commerce, we're plugged into Exim Bank, uh, trade professionals, so we can help introduce you to uh, this club of trade nerds that we have. So to kind of end with that, I want to respect everyone's time. I want to thank our panelists so much and again, remind everyone in the audience is we're a resource here for you to help you navigate through this. And, you know, uh, a big part of trade is about innovation, innovating your business model uh, to not only, you know, adapt to get into trade, but also to expand uh, your trade throughout the world if you're already doing, you know, one or two markets. So, um, with that, I'd like to thank our panelists. I don't know if there's any other uh, comments or remarks to wrap us up. I wanted to ask uh, Lauren to please share the contact page for Los Angeles SBDC Global Program and also Virginia Global Program. Also, you can um, 
locate your local SBDC center at the, the link listed on the website. Um, you will all be receiving the recording in the next few days. If you are in Los Angeles and Virginia region, please contact us. Even if not, we will, we will send you to the appropriate advisor and resources. You're not alone in your global expansion uh, endeavor. And thank you for your time today. This concludes our second LA to DC Goes Global program. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.